Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another exciting discussion in ANP. Um, where we're going from here, we just finished up our muscle notes. Um, it's that we're going to go into the neural tissue. Um, this session or unit will probably have five parts to it, so five lectures will probably be devoted to it, kind of like we did with the, the muscle lectures, and I will try to keep them at between 45 minutes and an hour at the most, so I won't have them be super long. Today what we're doing for the nerve tissue or the neural tissue is the same thing that we did at the beginning of the muscle chapters. We're going to kind of take a tour of the cell to see what kind of tissue and cells and what sort of structures that we're working with. And then we'll then turn this whole puppy on, turn the cell on, and look at how transmembrane potentials work. Um, you all will have um, a quiz that happens at the end of the month of October. And then we have an exam that comes up that very first week in November. And the only two things that will be on your exam will be chapter 10 and chapter 12. So now we're doing the second portion of what's going to be covered on your exam. So your nervous system includes all the neural tissue in your body. And a lot of times when we think about neural tissue, the only types of cells that we think about are neurons. And they're kind of the rock stars of the nervous system because they're the ones that are actively sending and receiving signals. However, it's also equally important to note that the neuroglia have a very large role to play because they help to support the neurons. So the neuroglia as well as the neurons are all part of that neural tissue that makes up both your peripheral nervous system and your central nervous system. So as I said before, um, two kinds of cells in this neural tissue, neurons, which are considered, they're kind of the rock stars. Everyone gives them all the credit for everything, and they're so popular, and everyone loves a neuron. But it's neuroglia, the glial cells, that help to support and protect the neurons. So a way that I like to give the analogy is kind of like the neurons are like Britney Spears. So she gets to have all the spotlight, all the attention, but the neuroglia are the sound guy, the pyrotechnics guy, the makeup artist, the hair artist, um, costume, the, uh, what's that thing called, the auto synthesizer thing. So all of those people that are working in the background to make Britney Spears look good when she performs. So the neuroglia, they're kind of the supporting cast members, whereas the neurons, they're the ones that are actively sending and receiving signals. And when we look at those cells of the neurons and the neuroglia, they can be grouped into both neurons and neuroglia into two separate categories. You have the peripheral nervous system, and you have what we're going to talk about now, the central nervous system. Your central nervous system consists of your brain and your spinal cord. And anything that comes out of them would be considered part of the peripheral nervous system. So the nerves that connect the nervous system with other systems, you guys are very intimately acquainted with this process from the neuromuscular junction, where the nerve will connect with the muscles. And we talked about the activities that happen um, at the neuromuscular junction. And then we also have sensory receptors such for sense organs, such as your ears and your eyes. Those are all what we considered organs of the organ system, of the nervous system. We can also take the nervous system and we has two different anatomical divisions. And as I said before, the brain and the spinal cord, they both belong to the central nervous system. And the peripheral nervous system, that's going to house all of those nerves. So if we're talking about the nerves that will join with the muscles and the neuromuscular junction, that would be part of the peripheral nervous system. If we're talking about the activities in the brain and the activities in the spinal cord, then that would be part of the central nervous system. So for your central nervous system, again, brain and spinal cord, um, it contains neural tissue, and that neural tissue would be in the form of the neurons, which are the cells that actively send and receive signals, and it would also be in the form of the neuroglia, which are the um, supporting cast member cells. You also have lots of blood vessels there, so they can make sure that it gets the nutrients and the energy that's required to send and receive signals. Big job of the central nervous system is to process information and coordinate the appropriate response from the central nervous system. So any sensory data that comes into the body from the outside, whether it's light in the form of photons, so your photoreceptors in your eyes send that information to your brain, or whether it's touch that your tactile carpuscles in your skin are able to recognize and they send that information to your brain, or it's nociceptors that sends information to your brain about pain, any of those outside stimulus, all of that information goes to your central nervous system, and then your central nervous system 
job is to not only process that information and say, ah, oh, that was a cane signal, oh, that's light, ah, oh, that's sound, but then to also um, coordinate with the appropriate response would be. So higher order functions, intelligence, memory, learning, withdrawing your hand back for a reflex, which is a much lower level function of your brain and spinal cord, those are all jobs of the central nervous system. Central nervous system can send out motor commands. Whenever you see motor commands on here, I want you to think about skeletal muscles because remember, acetylcholine binds to the motor end plate of a skeletal muscle, so that kind of helps you to put that idea of motor commands come from the central nervous system and they command the muscles, the motor end plate, um, to do something. And your peripheral nervous system, those are just all of your uh, neural tissues that are outside of the central nervous system. Unlike the central nervous system, where its job was to process and coordinate um, signals that were coming in and what signals should go out and what commands should go out, the job of the peripheral nervous system is to carry sensory information to the central nervous system. And all of those things that we talked about, pain as a sense, light, sound, um, touch, any of those stimuli that would happen outside of the body, or even some stimuli that happen in the body but outside of the nervous system, that's what we consider sensory information. It's something that the peripheral nervous system will pick up and it sends that information via nerves to the central nervous system. At the same time, the appropriate commands that have been dictated by the central nervous system, so let's say you touch something hot and your brain says we should move our hand away from that thing that we touched that's hot. Moving your hand away, that motor command that says, okay, withdraw hand, that's going to come along the, the peripheral nervous system. So the command itself comes from the central nervous system and it still goes on what we consider um, the motor aspect of it, but the motor command is carried through peripheral tissues or peripheral, the peripheral nervous system. Because remember, the peripheral nervous system are the nerves that connect the rest of the body with the central nervous system. So the nerves, also called peripheral nerves, um, are bundles of axons with connective tissue and blood vessels as well. Remember, they carry sensory information to the central nervous system, brain and spinal cord equal central nervous system, and it carries motor commands out through the peripheral nervous system. So the commands, what you should do, the appropriate response, the stove is hot. That sensory information came in on the PNS and the central nervous system received that information. They processed it and says, hmm, perhaps because the stove is hot, we should remove our hand. So that motor command, withdraw hand, is going to also come to the peripheral nervous system. Cranial nerves will connect to the brain and then spinal cord nerves will connect to the, the spinal cord. And there are 12 pairs of cranial nerves that we're going to learn in our very last lab practical, for our very last lab practical. So we talked about the anatomical divisions of the nervous system where we said we can take it apart and we have the central nervous system, brain and spinal cord, and then you have the nerves, anything outside of the central nervous system, peripheral nervous system. We also have functional divisions on what their job is. The afferent division, and I'm going to highlight this because it's very important, and we're going to talk about afferent and efferent for a while, from now until the end of your anatomy and physiology career. The afferent division carries sensory information. And so it's going to carry that sensory information from the peripheral nervous system on sensory receptors to the central nervous system. So photons of light, um, pain, temperature, touch, taste, sound, any of those stimuli would be senses that are picked up outside of your body and that information will be carried to the central nervous system along what we considered afferent as part of the afferent division of the peripheral nervous system. Because we're still talking peripheral nervous system here. Because the central nervous system, they're just brain and spinal cord, stays in one spot and it just processes the information. The efferent division of the peripheral nervous system is going to carry motor demand, commands. So whatever the appropriate response is from the central nervous system, whether it's to move your hand or to secrete insulin or whatever it is that needs to be done, the central nervous system sends that command to the peripheral nervous system via the muscles and the glands. So the muscles and glands will then carry out that wish. This we're very familiar with because we talked about in the neuromuscular junction how 
acetylcholine is released from the presynaptic cell and it goes across the synaptic cleft um, and binds to the motor end plate of the muscle cells. And because of that binding of the motor to the motor end plate of the muscle cells, sodium ions will come in and it will trigger an action potential. And that action potential is going to cause for a cascade of events to happen where the muscle is going to contract. So that command, make muscle contract, came from the central nervous system. And that's carrying the efferent division. So efferent division, big thing to remember here, carries motor commands. Afferent division carries sensory information. So as part of those afferent and efferent divisions, we have things that are called receptors and effectors. Receptors are going to detect changes or respond to stimuli. So you have neurons that can do that or specialized cells and sometimes even complex sensory organs such as your eyes and your ears. Your effectors, on the other hand, respond to those efferent signals or those motor commands and they could be other cells or they could be other organs. In the case of the neuromuscular junction, the effector is a muscle cell. For the efferent division of the peripheral nervous system, it can be further broken down into the somatic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. Your somatic nervous system, soma means body, is going to control skeletal muscle contractions, both voluntary and involuntary reflexes for muscle contractions. The autonomic nervous system is going to be what you don't actually have conscious control over here. So the autonomic nervous system can then be further broken down into the sympathetic division and the parasympathetic division. So really, what we're working with here, and I'm going to put a new page up so that I can kind of start to draw this so it hopefully doesn't look too ridiculous just to kind of show you what we're dealing with here. So far, we haven't really talked about any nerves. We haven't really talked about any specific types of neuroglia. Um, we've just talked about what the nervous system consists of and how we can break it down. So I'm going to draw kind of one of these flow chart things. We have our nervous system. That nervous system can be broken down into the anatomical divisions, which would be your central nervous system and you have your peripheral nervous system. The peripheral nervous system can be further broken down into your afferent division and your efferent division. This efferent division can then be further broken down into the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. So parasympathetic and your sympathetic. Um, and they're going to have very different roles that they play here. Your afferent division has different receptors and sensory neurons that are responsible there. And your efferent division gets broken down and I'll just write parasympathetic and then this your sympathetic. One of these is responsible, um, you can't control it at all and the other one you can control. So, oops, didn't mean to do that one. Let's go back to where we were here. So your efferent division, you have somatic nervous system and your autonomic nervous system and I, let me fix this real quick because we have our um, somatic, this should be somatic and then we have our autonomic which then gets broken down into your sympathetic and your parasympathetic. So this is just how they all relate to one another because your central nervous system doesn't really have a whole lot that's going on there. You just have for the brain and the spinal cord. But the peripheral nervous system where you have the afferent division and the efferent division and the efferent division can further be broken down into the somatic division and the autonomic division. This one more for your voluntary control or think muscle contractions. Muscle contractions. And this one under your involuntary control, your autonomic nervous system, sympathetic and parasympathetic. 
Your sympathetic division of your nervous system has a stimulating effect or your fight or flight, and your parasympathetic division has a relaxing effect or rest and repose. And we'll talk a lot more about the sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions of the peripheral nervous system as we go through our notes and we go through the nervous system, but for right now, we just kind of want to introduce that these are the functional divisions of the peripheral nervous system. And this is how they kind of all relate to one another. So now we finally get to talk about some neurons. So the major organelles um, of a neuron are the nucleus and the nucleolus. Um, the nucleus obviously houses genetic materia, and the nucleolus is going to um, be a process part of that um, part of that area. We have the perikaryon, which is really just a fancy name for cytoplasm. We also have the mitochondria, which will produce lots of energy, reticulum, reticulum, and ribosomes, which will make neurotransmitters. Um, ribosomes make proteins. Many of these neurotransmitters are protein based. You have your cytoskeleton, which would normally we'd call them um, microfilaments and microtubules, but since we're in the nervous system, we call them neurofilaments and neurotubules. And you have neurofibrils, which are bundles of neurofilaments that support um, the dendrites and the axon. So all of these are structures or organelles that are in the cell body of a neuron. The nasal bodies are really just areas of ref, ri, reticulum, reticulum, and ribosomes. And those nasal bodies are going to make up what we call the gray matter. So it makes the, the neural tissue appear to be a gray co color, so we call it the gray matter. Dendrites are highly branched extensions from the neurons, and the dendrites are always going to um, receive information from other cells. So the axon sends the information, but the dendrites are going to be what receives it. Um, so there are these little branches or extensions of the neuron itself that receives sensory information. The axon, on the other hand, is going to be what carries the electrical signal or carries the action potential, so or carries the message. It's another way to think of it. Dendrites receive the message. Axons are going to carry the message. Unlike the dendrites, they're not just you know several um, extensions of the neuron. It's just one singular long axon that will then branch out at the very end of it. In the axon, um, because it's very important in carrying the signal, we give the, um, the cytoplasm in the axon a slightly different name. We call it axoplasma. In that axoplasma, you have those neural tubules, which provide the framework upon which the vesicles that the neural transmitters are carried upon. Um, that's going to come on there. You have neural fibrils. Once again, they, they, they form, if you will, the superhighway of the axon to bring the information, the neural transmitters from the cell body onto the axon itself, and there are various enzymes, mitochondria, and all sorts of other organelles as well. The axolina is just the cytoplasm, I'm sorry, the cell membrane of the axon. So in much the same way that the sarcolemma was just the plasma membrane of a muscle cell, the axolemma is just the plasma membrane of a nerve cell. So other features of the axon is that we have collaterals, which are branches of the single axon. So remember I said before that the dendrites, they have these very many fine processes that consist of the dendrites that are receiving this signal or receiving the message, whereas the axon is one cylindrical singular um, structure that's going away from the cell body that's sending the message. Well, at the very end of that axon, it starts to branch off, um, and we call the branching off of the axon those collaterals, and then at the very end of those collaterals, you have the teledendria, which are just extensions of the axon, and at the tips of each of those teledendria, you have the synaptic terminal. Now, this term synaptic ter terminal is not something that's foreign to us because we talked about the synaptic terminal in the neuromuscular junction where we talked about how acetylcholine is released from the synaptic terminal and it goes against, uh, goes across the synaptic cleft to bind to the motor end plate allowing for sodium ions to come in. So synaptic terminal is just the very end of the axon, more specifically the very end of the telodendria. So here's a nice picture of all that happening. So here we have our axon, and then we have our telodendria, and at the very end we would have our synaptic terminals, and the space between the presynaptic cell, or the cell that's sending the message, and the cell receiving it, we call that the synaptic cleft. And then we have our dendrites, where there are many um, 
uh, fine processes here um, that are receiving the message, and then we have our cell body that will coordinate the appropriate response, whether we send excitatory or inhibitory neurotransmitters. They will make their way along those neural filaments, along the axo, uh, the axon itself in the uh, axoplasma, and reach the end of the telodendria and the synaptic terminals. So what we're looking at here, there are different types of neurons. This is sort of the generic anatomy of what we consider a multipolar neuron. So a few of these terms we have seen and taught before. Presynaptic cell is the neuron that sends the message, and I'm going to highlight that because it's important. It's not only important that you know it for this chapter, but also have an understanding of it for the muscle chapter, what we just finished. And so that would mean that the postsynaptic cell would be the cell that receives the message. The postsynaptic cell does not always have to be another neuron, because in the case of the neuromuscular junction, the presynaptic cell was the neuron sending the message that says, hey, muscle, I want you to contract. And the postsynaptic cell is a muscle cell. So it's not even a neuron, that postsynaptic cell. It's just a cell that receives that message. Sometimes the postsynaptic cell can be a neuron, um, but sometimes it can just be any other kind of cell. In the case of the neuromuscular junction, it's a muscle cell, but it can also be a gland. And then that synaptic cleft is just that gap that separates the presynaptic membrane and the postsynaptic membrane, or that space between the two. At the synaptic knob, um, this is where neurotransmitters will be found. And what neurotransmitters are is that they are chemical messengers that are released from the presynaptic membrane, and then they're going to uh, bind to the receptors on the postsynaptic membrane. They also get further broken down by enzymes so that they can be recycled again by that presynaptic cell. Um, and that recycling or reassemblage happens at the synaptic knob. One neurotransmitter we talked about already is acetylcholine, or ACH. So acetylcholine is that chemical messenger that's released from the presynaptic cell of the neuromuscular junction. And when it binds to the motor and plate of the receiving cell, the postsynaptic cell, i.e., the motor and plate of the muscle cell, it then allows for that muscle cell to allow sodium ions to come in, and it triggers that action potential. So you're already very intimately acquainted with a specific neurotransmitter. Also, when we're done with acetylcholine, we have that enzyme, acetylcholine esterase, that will break down acetylcholine, and those broken down parts of it will be taken back up by the presynaptic cell in order to recycle it and use it again. Axoplasmic transport is just um, the transportation of neurotransmitters or other proteins that are made by the cell, um, the cell body, and it makes its way down to the end of the axon. And what powers the movement of these vesicles that are holding these proteins um, and holding these neurotransmitters that have been made by the cell body, specifically by those initial bodies, the rough endoplasmic reticulum and the ribosomes, um, what powers the movement of these products that have been made is the mitochondria. So the mitochondria helps to make sure that those neural tubules um, keep these vesicles moving towards the end. So that's why I kind of called it the internal superhighway, those neural filaments and um, um, neural uh, tubules along the axon because they take materials that have been made by the cell body and then move it on down to the um, synaptic terminal where they'll be released. So the different kinds of classification of neurons, they don't all look like multipolar, uh, multipolar neurons that are the most common in the central nervous system. Um, and those would include those that are in the neuromuscular junction. Um, actually, all of those are multipolar neurons. But some neurons would be considered anaxonic neurons. Um, they don't really have an axon. And you find those mostly in your brain and in your sense organs. Um, bipolar neurons are special sensory organs, such as your eyes. So your photoreceptors are considered bipolar neurons. They're going to have these um, axonic extensions that happen from on both ends of them. Unipolar neurons are only found in sensory neurons of the peripheral nervous system. So for any of these classifications of neurons, just really want you to understand that not all neurons are exactly the same. They're different depending on what their role is for their specific job. So those are the anatomical classifications of neurons. Here's the functional classification of neurons. What is it that they're supposed to do? So any of these 
structural classifications of neurons can fit into one of these three categories. So we could have bipolar neurons that are sensory and so forth. So sensory neurons are going to be part of the afferent division, which means they take information from outside of the central nervous system, temperature, pain, light, touch, whatever it is, and they send that information to the peripheral nervous system. Those are called sensory neurons, if they're part of that afferent division, that they can pick up different sensations. Motor neurons are part of the efferent division, which means that they're actively carrying out commands from the central nervous system. Withdraw your hand away. Release insulin. Release glucagon. Don't release these things. So those motor commands are part of that efferent division of the peripheral nervous system. And then inner neurons you find mostly in your spinal cord, and they're what we consider association neurons, that they kind of join the, it's the part of the processing part of, the, of this process in the central nervous system in your brain and spinal cord where the sensory information comes in and before it's sent to the motor neuron it can go through an interneuron where it processes that. So the interneurons are kind of like the middleman. They, are, they um, coordinate the information that comes in from the sensory neurons to what would, to sending that information to the motor neurons to coordinate the appropriate response. So jobs of sensory neurons, and some of which we've already talked about, is that we said sensory neurons can monitor external information, such as temperature, pain, light, sound, all of those things would be considered um, somatic sensory neurons when it's the effects of the external environment are being sent to the central nervous system, or it can also monitor internal signals, and we call those visceral sensory neurons. Um, sensory neurons are usually unipolar. Um, their cell bodies are grouped together in what we call a sensory ganglia, and then they'll have their um, axons that are kind of outside of that. And then we have afferent fibers, which will extend from the sensory receptors of the central nervous system. So um, really all that's saying is that you have these um, additional fibers that are coming from the sensory receptors that will extend to the sensory neuron itself to bring that information into the ganglia or that group of cell bodies of the sensory neuron. Types of sensory receptors, and we'll talk more about these in AMP2 and a little bit more about them at the end of this semester. Interoral receptors, and what you see in this is inter, and I see internal or parts of internal, are going to monitor internal systems, so digestive, respiratory, cardiovascular, urinary, so forth, and any internal senses, taste, deep pressure, pain, interoceptors will detect that information and send it to, through sensory neurons, to the central nervous system. Exoceptors, I see exit in that, those are going to be your external senses, so things like touch, temperature, pressure, sight, smell, hearing, all of those things that are coming from outside, the stimuli that come from outside of the body will be detected by the external receptors and then sent through sensory neurons to the central nervous system so that that information can be properly processed. And then proprio receptors, they're a little bit different from either internal or external receptors. They kind of have a little bit of both of them there, but their job is to maintain your position and movement of your skeletal muscle and joints, or in other words, it tells where your body is in space and time at any particular moment of the day so that you know that you're upright or you know that you're sitting down or where is your arm, where is your leg. They're able to detect where your body parts are in space and time. Motor neurons, remember when we talked about this before carry instructions from the central nervous system to the peripheral effectors. Um, we have two major efferent systems of that, the somatic and the autonomic. Somatic nervous system, all of those motor neurons that innervate your skeletal muscles, so whenever we talked about the neuromuscular junction, that was part of the somatic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system um, will send uh, information out from your central nervous system that you do not have conscious control over. So your smooth muscle contractions, your cardiac muscle contractions, um, the secretion from glands, the activity of your adipose tissue. So they're visceral motor neurons that innervate all of those other peripheral effectors. So in a nutshell, a good way to think about this, somatic stuff you have conscious control over. Autonomic nervous 
system stuff, the ANS, you don't have conscious control over it. So these motor neurons of the autonomic nervous system, you don't consciously think about the neurons sending the message to the heart or the smooth muscle or the glands. Whereas the motor neurons of the somatic nervous system, you do consciously think about that. Raising your hand, scratching yourself, whatever the command is that your central nervous system is sending out for that muscle to do. So we have two groups of efferent axons. Um, signals from the central nervous system were monitored neurons, the visceral effectors. They're going to pass what we call ganglia. So you have the preganglionic fibers and you have the postganglionic fibers. So after that grouping of cell bodies, those fibers there are considered postganglionic. And then before that grouping of cell bodies, um, we call pre. Interneurons, as we said before, are mostly located in your brain and your spinal cord, and they kind of coordinate the activities between or the information being sent and received from the sensory neurons and the motor neurons. Um, they're responsible for making sure that sensory information is distributed properly and that the motor information that goes out is properly coordinated. So these interneurons have a very big job in memory, planning, and learning because they're coordinating the information that comes in on the peripheral nervous system, on the sensory aspect of the peripheral nervous system, or the afferent division, and what goes out on the efferent division. So it's kind of coordinating information and signals received to information and signals that are going to be released out, and the appropriate commands or actions based on that, those sensations or that stimuli that came into the, the central nervous system. So now we're going to get a chance to talk about the glial cells. So remember, these are kind of your supporting cast members of the nervous system. They don't really get a whole lot of um, really good press, but they're equally important. So there are four different types of glial cells that are in the ner central nervous system alone. First type are ependymal cells. Ependymal cells form epithelium called ependyma. And I'm going to start highlighting things because, once again, I feel like these things are important. The job of the ependymal cells is to secrete cerebral spinal fluid. And because they're secreting the cerebral spinal fluid, then they need to be able to circulate it and monitor it. And then it also has stem cells required for repair. So this is one of the four types of neuroglia that you will need to know for your next test. And this is just for the central nervous system. The peripheral nervous system has its own class of neuroglia. Second type are astrocytes. Big job of the astrocytes are to maintain the blood-brain barrier. Um, it repairs damaged neural tissue. If a neuron is damaged, it can guide the neuron development. Um, and it also helps to control the interstitial environment. So the environment of around that cell and within that cell body, that's the job of the astrocytes. Biggest part I want you to remember is that they maintain the blood-brain barrier. There are some things that should not get across that blood-brain barrier. And one of the biggest things there are pathogens, anything that can cause the body to be ill. We need your brain and spinal cord to stay sterile. So if a pathogen crosses it, it can cause a host of different problems. It can cause um, there to be uh, meningitis. Bacterial meningitis is a problem, and it can be fatal. So we would try to keep the brain and the, the spinal cord as sterile as possible. We do have a neuroglia cell that helps to deal with some pathogens that may cross, but for the most part, we want to make sure that too many pathogens don't get across. Um, in addition, um, there are some drugs and toxins that can cross the blood-brain barrier. Alcohol is one of them, and that's why you feel those kind of woozy effects when you drink too much alcohol. But the overall job of the astrocytes is to make sure that blood-brain barrier is maintained so that you don't have things getting into the central nervous system that you don't want. Third type of the four are the oligodendrocytes. And the job of the oligodendrocytes is to form the myelin sheath. Where there is myelination, there is going to be um, an increased speed of the action potential. So myelinated axons send, sig send signals faster than non-myelinated axons. And the oligodendrocytes are responsible for doing that um, in the central nervous system. They're called a little bit different in the peripheral nervous system. 
so that process of myelination increases the speed of the axons. And the way that it does that is it's going to insulate the myelinated part of the axon so that the signal has to jump in between those areas of myelination. And the areas between myelination, we call those nodes, or the nodes of Ramnier. And they're just gaps in between the inner nodes. Inner nodes are the myelinated part of that. Where the nodes are, where there is no myelination, that's where an action potential will take place. And it will just jump from one node to the next node. And as a result of being able to jump from one node to the next, it increases the speed at which that action potential is able to move. Whereas if you had to go continuously along the axon, it would take longer for that signal to be sent. So here's a great picture of that, and I'm going to change this to a pencil just to show you what we have. Those spaces in between this area of myelination are considered your nodes. And the signal, instead of just running continuously along the length of the axon, it just jumps from this node to this node. Um, well, I should have it going this way. This node to this node to the synaptic terminal. Um, so it moves much faster. Where there is myelination, you have a faster action potential. And then our fourth type of neuroglia in the central nervous system are glial cells. And these um, microglial cells, their job is to clean up debris, waste products, and pathogens. Remember I told you that the central, the central nervous system does have a little bit of um, a protection against any pathogens that come into it if it crosses the blood-brain barrier. The astrocytes don't do their job as efficiently as we would like. And those are your microglial cells. So this is kind of your immune property of your central nervous system. Um, what ganglia are, they're just masses of cell nerve bodies, and we talked about this already with postganglionic and preganglionic cells, and they're going to actively be surrounded by neuroglia. And we see this in the peripheral nervous system, not in the central. Now, for the types of cells, for the neuroglia cells that we find in the peripheral nervous system, we have satellite cells also called amphocytes, and they help to regulate the activity around the neuron. That's their supporting cast member job. And then Schwann cells, like oligodendrocytes in the central nervous system, so we're talking peripheral nervous system now, they also form myelination. So Schwann cells form myelination in peripheral nervous system. Oligodendrocytes provide um, myelination in the central nervous system. And once again, and this is just kind of a recap, the neurons perform all communication, information, processing, and control functions of the nervous system. So they're responsible for sending um, and receiving the message and coordinating the appropriate response to it. However, equally as important, although it doesn't get nearly as much attention, the glial cells help to preserve the physical and biochemical structure of the neural tissue and are essential to the survival and function of the neurons. So the glial cells have a supporting type role um, for the neurons. They're the supporting cast members of the neurons. If your nerve becomes injured, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's uh, gained over for an injured nerve. You can have some regeneration to it. The first step in this regeneration is what we call Wallian degeneration. And Wallian degeneration means that the part of the axon that's furthest away from the injury is going to disintegrate and go away so that when we regrow our axon, it has a nice clear path to go through. The second part of that is that the swan cells are going to make a new path for the axon that's going to grow in there, and then they will also wrap up the new axon in myelin. And remember, if you have myelination, it's going to increase the speed of the action potential. It's going to increase the speed of the signal reaching the end of the neuron. Um, how much nerve regeneration we can get in the central nervous system, because back here, we're talking peripheral nervous system. In the central nervous system, how much regeneration we can get by that is limited by the astrocytes, because remember, those astrocytes they block, uh, they form the blood-brain barrier, so they're going to block some growth and they'll produce a little bit of scar tissue. So we can't really regenerate the axon of nerves as efficiently in the central nervous system as we can in the peripheral nervous system. But there is some regeneration. I know for many students and many people, you've heard the adage that once you lose a neuron or you've damaged a neuron, it's gone. You can't do anything else about it. And that's only partially true. It depends on where the neuron has been damaged. Um, is it the cell body? Is it the axon? Is it 
all the dendrites, is it one of the dendrites, and it also depends on the severity of the damage. So if we're talking um, a lot of damage that's take place, and no, there can't be very much regeneration. There's just too much work to be done, too much repair to be made. But if we're only talking a little bit of it, then we can regrow parts of those axons or parts of those dendrites. And it also depends on what type of nerve or neuron, if it was a central nervous system neuron or a peripheral system ner neuron. Central nervous system neurons are more difficult to repair, not that they can't be repaired, but they're a little bit more difficult to be repaired um, because of the role of astrocytes um, than peripheral system neurons. So here we have a pretty picture of that Wallian degeneration that's taking place. Notice that at that end of the distal stump, um, that part of the axon, which is in blue, is being wrapped up and it's being disintegrated. Um, and then what you'll find is that this yellow part are going to form the swan cells, and they're going to carve and make a path so that um, the new neuron, the blue part, can go through there. So swan cells um, form. They grow into and cut um, the stumps. Macrophages are going to engulf those debris, and they'll, the swan cells are kind of just making a way um, for the new neuron to grow. And then the axon starts to kind of go through there um, where the path that's been made by the swan cells. And the axon continues to grow into the distal stump that's enclosed by the swan cells. What we can note, though, is that although this neuron was able to repair itself, it's not quite the same as it was before. Notice that the diameter of the axon is much thinner at the area of repair than it was originally. So that could mean a couple of things. That could mean that the action potential is going to be slowed down as it goes from this portion of the neuron to the next portion of the neuron. Um, it could slow it down, doesn't mean it's going to completely stop it, but there's not going to be as much of a, the signal strength and response will not be the same as it was before the injury. All right, so that's all I wanted to get done for today. So on Monday, we will talk transmembrane potential and action potential, which I think you're going to find pretty interesting, at least I do, because um, much of this you already know about. We've talked about this in the neuromuscular junction and the role of sodium ions. We're just going to add another layer on top of that and talk about repolarization. We saw what ha we've seen what happens when it goes up, going from negative 70 millivolts to plus 30, and we call that generating an action potential. We're just going to add another layer of definitions on there, and we'll talk about what happens when we go from plus 30 back on down to that resting potential of a negative number. All right. Have a great day, and I will see you all very soon.